space. I reckon that's a lonely place to call home for two travel-weary blue astronauts. But between the long shifts of fishing for hydrocarbon in the lakes of Saturn's moon Titan, there's just enough time to get some picking in. So hush up your mug and fetch a jug of lunar shine while you can join us in the loneliest honky-tonk this side of the Appalachian supercluster. By God, here she is a cop. New transmission of podcast with Marcel, featuring Hayes Griffin. Oh, uh, hey, Hayes, what's up? Oh, not much, buddy. How are you doing? I'm good, man. I was, I was thinking maybe we could stop by, hang out with JD again. Oh, absolutely, dude. I had such a great time the first time. Let's do this. Yeah, you know what? Maybe this time don't order an IPA. Oh, dude, do you even have to bring it up? All right, I get it. <laughs> Sports Bar Vibes, Miller Lights. <laughs> All right, we're just gonna go up, we're gonna order, keep it casual. Can I get you boys anything to drink? Um, yeah, JD, can I do uh, just a Miller Lite? Hey, do you want something? That'll be the same for me, sir. Coming right up. All right, good, smooth, easy. <laughs> uh, all right, dude, let's go sit down. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't want you to get too used to this. I feel like every time we sit down at this bar, I, I tell you some crazy stuff, but I think I'm going to tell you some crazy stuff again. Is that all right? I mean, I guess, dude. That's uh, that's that's what this is for, I guess. You know, we're we're setting the standard. <laughs> hey, I'm just worried that I'm becoming known for conspiracy theories. <laughs> Looks like Marcel's spinning a yarn about bluegrass conspiracies. So I've I've been sitting on this for I want to say nine years. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah. No, this is this is deep. And uh, I wanted to make a video on it multiple times, and I kind of chickened out because it's kind of a tough subject to talk about. We got we to gotta be a little bit careful. You don't know what it is yet, but I'm just prepping you. But it is, uh, I think it's really important. I think it would be easier to just kind of have a discussion about it rather than to try to make like a scripted video and like, I feel like when you make a scripted video, it's like, oh, these are my thoughts, this is exactly what I think. And then you misspeak a little bit and everyone's like, ah, you're a jerk. <laughs> exactly, yeah, it's like, Marcel doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> but maybe if we just have a discussion, we can have a little bit more of an open time here. Um, you know this kind of like uh, country, bluegrass, yodel, hiccup kind of sound? Absolutely. <laughs> where, where do you think that comes from? Oh, man, that's a really good question. I mean, like, I obviously know this isn't, like, where it comes from, but as far as, like, when I think bluegrass country hiccup yodels, there's a couple people that come to mind. Number one, Jimmy Rogers being kind of, like, the bluegrass hiccup yodel kind of guy. And if you're if we're talking, like, hiccup yodel kind of thing, I know this isn't, like, total bluegrass or country, but, like, Buddy Holly, too, I feel like he had a very kind of good command of this, but but honestly, beyond the modern recording industry times, no clue on my end. You also have like, you know, like Bill Monroe did some of the yodel stuff, obviously sort of off of Jimmy Rogers. Yeah, exactly. Another one I'd throw out there would uh, probably be Hank Williams. Yep. Okay, everyone that we've listed is all a fan of the same artist who invented the yodel hiccup. And no one talks about this guy. For good, <laughs> for good reason. Yeah, for good reason no one talks about this guy. So it's a guy named Emmett Miller. Emmett Miller was a minstrel performer. Oh, here we go. Yeah, Hayes knows where this is going now. Emmett Miller was, uh, if you don't know what the minstrelsy is, what we're talking about is essentially blackface. We're talking about early, it was sort of like a, a vaudeville type of show. And it was very popular in America through maybe the 1850s, I want to say, through like early 1900s, but it died out very, very quick. So it was sort of here one day and then gone the next. You know, just to dispel any rumors too, and hopefully not get too controversial, but minstrelsy is a is a is a product of the North. A lot of people think that it's sort of this Southern thing, but it's not. It came out of sort of the show scene of, you know, think about like New York or something. That's where minstrelsy comes from. And there's a saying about minstrelsy that it was born in the North and it died in the South. And that's very true. Some of the last minstrel shows that we had were in the South. And Emmett Miller comes right at the tail end of that. Emmett Miller doesn't pass away until like the mid 1900s. It's it's over for him. He is like the last of the last of. Just as a, a side fact, there there is one good DVD of sort of like authentic minstrel performance. I don't know why you'd want to watch that, but 
I own it because I'm so interested in this Emmett Miller thing. And uh, it's really hard to come across, but it's sort of the, you know, the first and last time it was ever filmed. And Emmett Miller is one of the musicians that's filmed in it, um, which made it sort of archivally of interest to me because he influenced so many of these great country musicians. <laughs> like, you want to hear them, right? Yeah, absolutely. Here's the thing about Emmett Miller. Let's start with Lovesick Blues, because I feel like that's the one. Now, I can't play anything from before or from after, like, 1926 because of copyright, but I can play some early recordings. And here is Lovesick Blues as sung by Jack Shea. And he's one of the earlier recordings. There's another one by Elsie Clark, I want to say, something like that. Don't, don't quote me on that, but this is very deep <laughs> stuff. <laughs> So yeah, this one's from, uh, you know, 1920 or something, 1922. And uh, it sounds like this. You'll notice that the yodel is missing. Those lovesick blues got the feeling called a blue. Since the sweetie said goodbye, seems I don't know what to do. All I do is sit and cry. And normally I've got a feeling called the blues. That word has a bunch of uh, sort of yodel in it, right? Yeah, absolutely. So that yodel that you hear in the Hank Williams recording is actually Emmett Miller's signature move. Emmett Miller would do that specific yodel from Lovesick Blues. He did it in, I don't know, maybe like 20 or 30 songs. So what you think of as the Hank Williams yodel is just the Emmett Miller yodel. It sounds like this. Since my mama said goodbye, it seems I don't know what to do, 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 do. All I do is sit and cry. Oh, Lord, Dude, I that is exactly what Hank Williams does. That is like, like inflection note for note exactly what Hank Williams does on that. And, and I don't want to sound mean, but if you go listen to the Hank Williams version now, you'll hear how much better Emmett Miller is at it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. I love it. I mean, that was a pretty clean yodel. I'll say that right there, you know? Yeah. Anyway, I, I know that those recordings are safe for me to play. Uh, there's a lot more from Emmett Miller. Um, it used to be on Spotify, but they took it off. But uh, you can find it on YouTube. A lot of people have these old records and have been nice enough to post them. There's one called, I believe it's called the... The jazz singer from Alabama, the blues singer from Alabama. It's one of those. And Emmett Miller probably does my favorite version of the yodel. He just crushes it. So good. I don't remember when that one's recorded from, so I, I don't want to play it. <laughs> yeah. But go look it up. It's worth listening to. I put all this together sort of on my own, and then I found out this uh, about this book by a guy named Nick Toshes. It's called Where Dead Voices Gather. I mean, I don't want to make this weird, but it's kind of like a it's kind of like a love letter to Emmett Miller. It's just about how influential he was and how forgotten he is, sort of what it means to tangle with that. Should we remember him because of his accomplishments or you know, is minstrelsy something that we should, you know, maybe talk about less? And it's a really hard conversation. It's a really difficult, interesting conversation. But all the bad things about minstrelsy don't change the fact that Emmett Miller was an amazing singer. You know, I don't want to give him too much of a benefit of a doubt, but it possibly just grew up in a time period where this is how you made it in the industry. This was the prevailing choice, so that's what he did. Absolutely. I, I, to me, that's like, like you said, it's a really complex thing. I feel like Scholars are still duking this out on the battlefield of academia right now for how to treat this kind of stuff because it definitely floats into, you know, you and I know very well from playing bluegrass fiddle tunes and stuff. A lot of those come from this minstrel era or a time where uh, race relations weren't so great in the United States, so they have right. offensive titles. And it's like, do you just change the title and keep playing the tune or do we get rid of the tunes, you know? Uh, so... Yeah, that's that's it, but kind of like you're saying with Emmett Miller, it's like if the tune is is good, it's it's a document of our history somehow. You know what I mean? Like you personally speaking, I don't think it it's great to like ignore these things because to me that's like a revisionist history. You know what I yeah. mean? To kind of like take it out. But in terms of glorifying and uplifting these voices that maybe, you know, participated in things that um, were offensive and destructive to perceptions of, of African Americans and black people in the United States, maybe that's not the greatest either, right? I, I think what's interesting is when, when, when the country was moving on from the minstrelsy, which, like I said, we did very quickly, jazz music, you know, bluegrass, rock and roll, all of those things just took over and minstrelsy was just dead overnight. It, it's almost like it was dismantled. The things that uh, that weren't related to race, that people found enjoyable about minstrelsy, they kept alive, which 
is strange to say, but it's true. So something like Lovesick Blues, you know, this version of the song comes out in 1922, and the Hank Williams version comes out in 1954, something like that. Let's look online. What's it say? Hank Williams comes out in 1952. Emma Miller comes out in 1925. That's pretty close. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, close enough. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, Hank Williams is willing to re-record the song and re-release it in sort of America post-minstrelsy, right? There, there's a lot of famous comedy bits that, uh, for instance, like Abbott and Costello would do that are just minstrel comedy bits. There's a really famous one that's an addition problem that you can look up. It's sort of two characters that are just arguing about math. And you can actually find a video of Emmett Miller doing that bit and then a video of Abbott and Costello doing that bit. Um, it's on that DVD that I mentioned, which is how I found out about it because when I watched it, I was like, oh, it's like that old... Abbott and Costello bit. If you look at other things, for instance, you were talking about the fiddle tunes, Turkey and the Straw comes from the minstrelsy. I won't say the original title of that one. That one's a particularly rough original title. Yeah, it, it begs the question, like, can a, can a melody be racist? Which is a really <laughs> loaded question. But it, it seems like people just took Turkey and the Straw and they're like, well, it's still kind of catchy. What if uh, it became associated with ice cream? Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I, 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 I seriously doubt that there was some cabal of evil intent that was like, no, we'll keep America's racist history alive by associating turkey in the straw with ice cream. No, I think it was just people enjoying that melody still. I mean, it's just like language over time. You know, that words are initially created sometimes to mean something, but how people use them just differs over time. People prefer to employ that word in a different way over time, and its meaning changes. So... You know, can a melody do the same, like you're you're saying here? You know, can can it it morph into something that is kind of disconnected from the original, maybe not so great? I want to circle back to this book for a second. I described it as uh, a love letter, and I highly recommend reading this book. But I wanted to give you all a kind of a taste of what I mean by love letter. It's an interesting read. This guy's got. Got a vibe to him, for sure. This is the second <laughs> paragraph of the book. The alchemy of Emmett Miller's music is as startling today as it was when he wrought it, definable neither as country nor as blues, as jazz nor as pop, as black nor as white, but as both culmination and transcendence of these bloodlines and more. That alchemy, that music, stands as one of the most wondrous emanations, a birth cry, really, of the many-faced and one-souled chimera of all that has come to be called American music. The very concept of him a white man in blackface, a hillbilly singer and a jazz singer both, a son of the Deep South and a rue of Broadway, is at once unique, mythic, and a perfect representation of the schizophrenic heart of what this country, with a straight face, calls its culture. Whoa. There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> it's a heavy what book. What this country with a straight <laughs> face calls its culture, huh? Dang. I mean, that, that does sound pretty love lettery. You know what I mean? Uh, in, in my opinion, he does some interesting stuff. There's some uh, there's some interesting moments in this book where, where to be honest, I felt a little offended at first when I read it. One of them was when he was talking about he, he was talking about black musicians um, dealing with the minstrelsy, living in a minstrelsy world, right? You know, the the narrative that that we hear a lot is that uh, a lot of what happened in the minstrelsy was, was stolen from black musicians and then we put it on the stage. And that's not really true. If you look at all the songs, they're all written by like Tin Pan Alley folks. They're all written by white people, you know, yep. doing like this, you know, pastiche of what they think black culture is or Southern culture is too. And um, he actually found the opposite. He found that a lot of black musicians were starting to sing minstrel songs, whether that be because they just enjoyed them or because they were hoping to work, you know, with a minstrel company because black folks also done the grease paint, right? That happened. They Absolutely. That was something I was just going to say. Like, the history of minstrelsy is so weird in that black people are incorporated into the art form at some point, right? Like, it's black people dressing up in blackface. They put, like you said, the face paint on in order to have that caricature-esque look of the minstrel performance, you know? So it's, yeah. I mean, some, some of these minstrel companies are the first mixed race cast that we have on a stage. That's wild. <laughs> Yeah, super wild, right? When I, before I knew about this book and I was doing some research, um, I was interested in where Emmett Miller was performing and when. Because this is where we get into the conspiracy theory. That was all just background, okay? Um, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so I was I was interested in when he was performing and where and sort of, you know, what his path around the country was. Yeah, if you're wondering what I do in my free time, I'm mapping out the tour routes of a 100-year-old blackface musician. <laughs> 
And the reason I was doing that is because I wanted to see if they overlapped with any other known performances of famous musicians. When you pull that thread, man. <laughs> so, I'm not ready for this, I can already tell. <laughs> <laughs> there's multiple times where, in very close proximity, uh, Emmett Miller and Jimmy Rogers were in the same town, and they might have talked to each other. I'm not accusing Jimmy Rogers of anything, I'm just saying. Hmm. I thought that was interesting, and so I did a little more research. And uh, if you're a fan of country music, you might know the name Ralph Peer. Ralph Peer is the guy who ran the 1927 Bristol Sessions. We call that the birth of country music. It includes Jimmy Rogers, but also the Carter family. And Ralph Peer got sent by Victor Recording Company. Ralph Peer is also an interesting character. He's the guy who coined the term race music and hillbilly music for white music and black music. So he's got his hand in this sort of messy pie, right? Well, guess what? Uh, Ralph Peer... <laughs> recorded Emmett Miller before he recorded Jimmy Rogers. Once again, not accusing Jimmy Rogers of anything, but there's multiple periods in Jimmy Rogers' life where he was either by someone that could have been like, hey, listen to Emmett Miller, or he was in the exact same location as Emmett Miller. Yeah. We know we know that Hank Williams stole it. That one's, that one's done. That's easy. <laughs> For sure. Like, the song is Emmett Miller's song, right? That he, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. That's an easy connection to draw. <laughs> Bob Wills um, would famously audition people for his group by asking them if they could sing Emmett Miller songs. That one is also a known. Also, Bob Wills sings Emmett Miller's version of I Ain't Got Nobody. Uh, that's just Emmett Miller's version. <laughs> yep, and that was famously what I heard, like the song that he used to audition people on. Uh, you know, because he he was looking for, he said, people that could hit Tommy Duncan's yodel l yeah. like it was on the original Wills record, but now you're telling me that that's actually the Emmett Miller <laughs> yodel. Yeah, it is. And if you look on, um, I mean, there's lots of people that have compiled lists of sort of who Emmett has maybe uh, influenced, but Duncan comes up. I think he's even on the Wikipedia page of people that were influenced. So uh, so there's that. It goes, it goes even farther than you think. Merle Haggard has a record called I Love Dixie Blues, and he dedicated the entire album to Emmett Miller. What? Yeah. So Hag. <laughs> if, if you look up Merle Haggard and Emmett Miller, if you just put those search terms into Google, you can actually find an interview where the interviewer asks him about Emmett Miller and they have a conversation about him. Emmett Miller is like this underground thing that all musicians love. All these like sort of starting... Oh, by the way, he Emmett Miller's recordings. A lot of them have like the Dorsey brothers, so there's a jazz connection too. So it, if it couldn't, you know, if it could get any deeper, right? It just did. Yeah. But Emmett Miller is influencing jazz, country, bluegrass all at once, right? His recordings are popular with all those people, and then you know, bam, minstrelsy's gone. And all those people are still kind of secretly listening to Emmett Miller because they love his singing voice so much, and they're trying to copy it, they're trying to do it, but it's not something that gets talked about outwardly. And so we have this question that I started with, like, where did the yodel and the hiccup come from? And everyone's like, shh. <laughs> no, it, it makes total sense now, you know what I mean? You've convinced me that this conspiracy theory, that there is, you know, there are dark, you know, lizard overlords pulling the strings of the the country yodel game behind the scenes or whatever. Yeah. Here's another interesting paragraph in the book. By the way, if it feels like I'm cherry picking, you know, these sort of like verbose paragraphs, no, the entire book is like that. Miller's first record makes it abundantly clear that he was already in 1924, one of the strangest and most stunning of stylists ever to record. In an age when scat singing was coming to represent a stylistic avant-garde of sorts, Miller's debut represented an avant-garde of its own, an all altogether otherworldly voice, a bizarre malarkey of the soul that seemed a death cry and a birth cry too. The last mutant mongrel emanation of old and dead and dying styles, the first mutant mongrel emanation of a style far more reckless and free than the cool of scat, the slurred arabesques, the yodel-like falsetto melismas. The attributes of Miller's brilliance as we know them are here, fluorescent and full. <laughs> Oh my god, dude. Try the book. I mean, it, it, once again, that's the most love letter like statement I've heard, you know, about Emmett Miller. That's that's kind of crazy. Yeah, if 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 any of this surprises you too, you should know that this is uh it's kind of true of a lot of um early songwriters and stuff. There there's a lot of connections to the minstrelsy that don't get talked about. I really don't want to misspeak on this subject, but I feel like Bob Wills or 
one of his contemporaries actually started at a very young age doing blackface and then transitioned out. I'm very reluctant to say that it was Bob Wills, but, um, you know, someone in that category did do that. But uh, that's also true of people like, um, uh, like Stephen Foster, you know, one of the most famous American songwriters, but I think also the first songwriter to make a living writing songs, which is very impressive. He never, he never went to the South. I don't know if you know that, but Stephen Foster, like, never act. He went to, like, Cincinnati. <laughs> That's, like... <laughs> as the South as he could get. <laughs> right. So he didn't really, like, ever see the South. So when you hear him sing, hear the songs that he's written, like, Oh, Susanna and Camp Town Races, The Old Folks at Home, roughly 175 other ones. <laughs> yeah, they're all just kind of, like, made up. It's this, like, Norman Rockwell version of the South. And where did Stephen Foster get his weird Norman Rockwell you know, view of the South, he got it from minstrelsy. I, I think that some of that view of the South kind of pervades. It certainly pervades into, like, early cartoons and stuff. We see this, like, weird idyllic thing and then these weird race relations, and then it's like, oh, this cartoon was banned. Wonder why. Yeah. Th that's why. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, if you look at those early, you know, like you're saying, Looney Tunes or Disney cartoons or any of that stuff, it's not even just like like a, a, a wisp of, like, minstrel being present in the, the cartoon. It's like they're just animating yeah, minstrel a shows. minstrel show. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I do want to double back and confirm that uh, I, I thought it was the case, too. Bob Wills, in fact, did perform in blackface in minstrel shows uh, in his early career. It says, like, 1929-ish. And everyone got out. Good for Bob. Yeah, exactly. That was not the place that you wanted to be. And I like, like I mentioned this briefly, too, that I think a lot of people wanted to make it in the music industry. And you live in a small town. You have these traveling shows coming through. What are the traveling shows coming through? They're minstrel shows. So you think, hey, if I want to be a musician, that's what I'm going to do. And then we end up with these forever forgotten names like Emmett Miller, which is really tragic. Once again, minstrel shows are awful. I don't want to take away from that. But it's also sad for talented people to get buried. I guess, on top of that. Yeah, it, they, the thing that they invested in turned out to be kind of like a, you know, societally destructive <laughs> force. Yeah. So their their entire life's work gets wrapped up in the this thing that we have swept under the rug collectively as a culture. Um, there's there's two things I want to say to to wrap this up because we don't we don't have to spend all day on this. Van Halen has covered an Emmett Miller song. I'll let that sink in. <laughs> and. <laughs> <laughs> and also, if you keep following the, the tour dates and where Emmett Miller appeared, there is a moment where uh, Hank Williams is performing, you know, Lovesick Blues, you know, at the Ryman Auditorium. And Emmett Miller is on the other side of town in some dive bar, probably performing the same song for like zero money. And it's in, you know, it's in the 1950s. It's insane. You, you can actually... Once again, like if you just look at all the dates and where they are, you can find this cross section where they're in the same town and Emmett Miller's playing nowhere and Hank Williams is making all the money. Yeah, I think pour one out for Emmett, man. Also, if you look up uh, Emmett Miller, be be prepared to see pictures of him in the grease paint. If you're not into that, maybe don't look it up. Crazy. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the Emmett Miller Wikipedia right now, and it's just like, the, the, there's only like a few paragraphs. I think anyone who looks this up would be underwhelmed by the Wikipedia article that's there. But in the two paragraphs that are there, you see some of the most famous names in jazz and country music listed as people who have been directly touched by his career. <laughs> How about that AI prank? Oh, man. I've been, I've honestly, this was one of those things, you know, a lot of people have asked me since it happened, they were like, so did you actually feel bad about that, Hayes? Like, did you feel like you were pranked really hard? And I was in it the whole time, man. I'm still like beaming from that entire, from that <laughs> entire deal, you know? Like, that was very well done, sir. Very well done. <laughs> I, I love that you kind of like peeled back the layers on your own, you know, because you brought up the message and then I got to be like, oh yeah, that was an AI too. <laughs> you, you were just like discovering how deep the whole went. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes me think that I should have maybe noticed earlier that it was happening to me, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's not it's not in the video, but when we were talking, you did go back and read the email, and you were like, yeah, this, this is weird. You wouldn't say that. No, it, I'm even thinking back to that point in time, like when I was reading that email, and that was honestly, like, 
a ridiculously busy week for me. And I, I think you sent it at the right time because I was that day that you sent the email, I was prepping for a trip to Michigan and it was like this stressful school assembly thing I was about to do. So I was like loading my entire PA into the car and I was like doing my checklist of all the gear. And then I get an email from Marcel in the middle of it. I'm like, oh God, now I've got something to take care of. You know, so like, I don't even like, you know what I mean? I don't look at it maybe as detailed as yeah. I would have because it's just like a million things are happening all at once. So you like, you seriously uh, chose the exact right time <laughs> to, that worked to do out so well. You know, I haven't talked to David Benedict. I don't even know if you've seen the video. <laughs> Surely someone would have shown it to him, right? If he hasn't seen it. I think so. I almost have to, right? I mean, if not, I'm sending him a text after we get off this call. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I sent him an email and was just like, hey, by the way, you're in this video. I don't remember doing that, though. Yeah, I, I found that thing really interesting because, because the fiddle tune was actually, like, not bad. It was a boring fiddle tune. But uh, but it wasn't a bad fiddle tune, and it, no. it kind of it, well, yeah. I was just gonna say that that was like the thing that I was maybe too polite to say because like the way that you would set it up was like I I had an hour to compose this fiddle tune, and with that in my mind, I was like, oh, this is a totally acceptable fiddle tune. Like if you only had sixty minutes to sit down and write something, you know, like like we even said in the video, it usually takes iteration after iteration to get like a decent idea, but. You know, so I like I was very happy with that based upon those criteria. This is funny. This will feel braggadocious, but I just want to <laughs> I want you to feel uh, I want you to understand my mindset even more. Sometimes when my students are like out sick or they have some other like life event, they're going on vacation or something. I'll write them a quick fiddle tune and I'll send it to them as if like, oh, if you have time, like here's a funny thing. It'll be like the vacation reel or, you know, the sick reel. And um, I normally write those in about 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I would even wager to say, maybe they're not as complicated, but I would say that they're more interesting than the than the tune that I gave you, right? Because like in writing this like really quick simple melody, I'm just like, oh, like make a statement, like say something, do do mm -hmm. like something interesting, that's some kind of arc. Whereas I feel like the fiddle tune that I gave you is just like, <laughs> like it's it's so not interesting that I didn't even feel the need to put the whole thing in the video. <laughs> Which is great because, like, some people were just oh, like, where's the fiddle like, tune? Where's the tune? And yeah, and what are they going to do? They're going to go listen to it and be supremely underwhelmed, right? Ex and, and that's the the thing I think you're getting at with the whole vibe of the fiddle tune, right? Like, it's a, it's a plain vanilla series of notes that qualifies as a fiddle tune, and we can leave it at that, right? Like, it's not like anything you're going to record on your next album, maybe. But I think, I think that if I had set it up differently... Like, imagine it like this. Imagine if I was just like, Hayes, I wrote a fiddle tune. What do you think? I feel like that would have been suspicious. You would have been like, this isn't very good. Yeah. Like, I've heard stuff that you've written. This isn't bad. <laughs> I, I think you're entirely right on that one. I think I would have definitely smelled something weird, you know, on, on that situation. Because, I don't know, listen to the, even the, 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 like, sizzlers and bumpers on your YouTube videos have, like, more interesting, compelling melodic statements in them than that fiddle tune, you know what I mean? Like, these three-second pieces of music that you create as transition music are, like, cooler, <laughs> you know, than... <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> Maybe it would have been more convincing if that generator would have done something in Lydian. And then you would have been like, oh, yeah, this is like the podcast theme. That's the one thing that when I was looking at Folk RNN, I didn't, I wasn't happy with the tonalities that you could choose. You know what I mean? For like once I went back after you had made the reveal and I saw how the fiddle tune was made, I, I think to get something totally wholly interesting out of it would be kind of impossible that way just because you've got Mixo. You've got Ionian and Aeolian, right? Was it just those three? Or Dorian was one of them, too. Dorian mode tunes also, were on Full Garnet. those other modes are, like, terrible. It's really hard to get something good out of the other modes. Yeah. I think because all the fiddle tunes that they sampled are major. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, right? Yeah. How, how much longer would you have been sitting there iterating through tunes if it was a Lydian thing? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Do, does part of you feel like, too, that, like, because people were having conversations with me about this afterwards, e even though, like, yes, the AI generated all the notes and, like, you told it to, like, redo an A part and all that kind of stuff, you were still the one that was, like, you were curating that entire time. 
You know what I mean? So it's like, does the computer even know that it created something worthwhile when we're still the one that's just like picking stuff out and putting it together? You know what I mean? You know, a lot of a lot of AI training has to has a uh, oh, I don't remember what they're called. I'm gonna seem like I'm not smart. A lot of them have <laughs> almost like one entity that like generates data, and then another entity that like judges the data. So they're kind of separate. There's like a creator and a judge or a reviewer or some a critic, I guess. There we go. We settled on words. <laughs> <laughs> so you you're kind of training both entities as you go, right? The creator gets better at creating stuff and it listens to advice from the critic, right? And the critic gets better at reviewing. I suppose you could add sort of another layer of AI on top of folk RNN. Or if you had a bunch of human beings generate tunes and then mark which ones are good, you could train a critic so that way folk RNN generated more pleasant tunes. But I, I think all of that's beside the point. What I would tell those people is that when you talk to ChatGBT, you are also curating, right? You're asking questions. You're like sort of dictating what response it's going to give you in that when you sit down to talk to ChatGBT, it doesn't start the conversation. You do. So folk aren't in. It's the same way. Yeah. You click the button, right? Yeah. 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 I love it. Although, what would that be like if ChatGPT did have some kind of like, you know, random conversation initiator? Somebody get open AI on the phone. Let's <laughs> I think that would be uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. Something tells me they've already experimented or are experimenting with that, you know? Yeah. I, I, t I told you this uh, at the end of the video, but um, but I, I also don't think it made the cut. But uh, one of my favorite things to do with ChatGPT, and this is not to protect myself for the inevitable robot uprising, this is just because I think it's funny, um, is to be like overly polite with it. And whenever it like generates you something, you respond to it and you're like, oh, thank you so much. This is great. Do you, do you have time for another? <laughs> I find that very amusing um, because it's like, oh, yeah, you know, as an AI, I have an unlimited amount of time. And I'm like, ooh, spooky. All right, let's do another one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did notice on some of the footage you had where you were, like, writing emails, having ChatGPT write emails to me or anyone else. You were like, hey, ChatGPT. <laughs> you know, you would, like, <laughs> you would, like, start every <laughs> yeah. message. By, like, I don't want to be rude. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I mean, it's a chat bot. I should be chatting with it. I should be commanding it. Bots are people too? Or no, something? we're not there yet. Give yeah. it a couple of years. Yeah. We'll, we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got plants are people too. We got animals are people too. Animals are people too is probably one of the funniest ones because, you know, they're animals. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get to We'll get to the robots. <laughs> I'm in. I'm waiting on it. I mean, and, you know, we just gave it a pretty good data set to push it, you know. One step further there. Now the robots know how to create better fiddle tunes, thanks to Marcel. Also, you know, just for all you listeners out there, uh, we are hiding one AI-generated sentence in every podcast, and it's your job to figure out which sentence was generated by an AI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we fed our voices into, uh, into like, a voice AI, and then we just tweeted the script from ChatGPT. And it just does the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is real Marcel popping in for a second just to let you know that uh, I don't even know who Emin Miller is or if he's a real guy. <laughs> <laughs> a million people just pulled out their phones and started Googling Emin Miller. <laughs> we'll see that spike on the Google Trends data for Emin Miller. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sounds like the boys might be talking about some bluegrass history. Yo, Marcel, we were chatting a few weeks back, and you brought up something that kind of, like, blew my mind and made me rethink this term that has been tossed around really ever since I was, like, a young adult in bluegrass. Mash. <laughs> All right? Yeah, like Mash. the potato, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Mashed potatoes, exactly. And we were talking about this, and apparently, like, when we think of MASH, we think of, like, early 90s Lonesome River Band or yeah. any of that kind of stuff. Like, mullets, electric bass, and, like, really hitting that low G note on your chord on beat one of bar one or whatever, right? Like, that's <laughs> MASH we're, we're talking about. But, like, you brought up the fact that Alison Krauss had some kind of... You know, and some people would consider Union Station and, like, some of her stuff to be in that genre, right? Yeah, but that yeah, there's yeah. kind of, like, Alison Krauss has an interesting relationship with this word and was seen using it, but maybe in a not-so-standard way like I just described. Like, could you talk about that a little more? Yeah, as far as I know, 
And if you if you know better than me, please let me know because I'm obviously into this nerdy stuff. But Alison Krauss is the first person to use the term mash publicly. Okay. As like as it refers to bluegrass, and it's in 1996, and it's a Rolling Stone interview. And actually, it's it's so well known for this quote among bluegrass nerds. Uh, at least I assume this is why. If you just search for Alison Krauss mash, it is one of the Google results. Is the Rolling Stone interview. So I think <laughs> a fair amount of people are coming to this Rolling Stone interview just to like see how MASH was used in 1996. And so maybe maybe give some examples of how you would use MASH in a sentence as a bluegrass musician. Oh, yeah, man. Well, you can definitely use it in, like, verb form. You know what I mean? Like, MASH that G chord. You know, I've heard, like, people, like, ma or MASH a G run. You know, like, they, they would say it that kind of way. Or even as, uh, I guess, maybe an adjective to describe the quality of the music. Like, oh, that's MASH, or that's real MASH, or that's so MASH. Like, that kind of mm -hmm. usage of, of the sentence. That's kind of how I'm familiar familiar with using it. There's also kind of like a command form that's like you like someone's playing something great and you're like mash <laughs> mash exactly yeah and it's like and is it a command form or you know like or or is it like an observation in that moment you know what i mean yeah, you can, sometimes yeah. it's hard to tell. <laughs> <laughs> anyway in the Rolling Stone interview, Alison Krauss uh, is talking about Merle Haggard, and she says, I listened to Merle Haggard last night talk about a mash, which is interesting, talk about a mash. And the interviewer says, a mash, question mark? And she says, yeah, he mashed me down. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Not the way I've used that term before, but... <laughs> uh, I can tell you just get a real kick out of that. Yeah, he mashed me down. <laughs> That's weird. I don't know what she means. I mean, I do, but I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is that how uh, you had to say it, Allison? <laughs> let me let me read the rest of it because it's funny. She says, uh, yeah, he mashed me down. Unbelievable. I tell you, I can't believe anybody is like that. When I was listening to that, I just about crapped myself. It's incredible. Yeah, she said he mashed me down and I just about crapped myself all in the same paragraph. That's pretty great. Yeah, it's it's uh, it might even be like a haiku or something. It's it's, <laughs> it's just it's so much good, you know, just in a couple sentences. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so if you're interested in MASH, I have this recommendation for you. An ETSU student wrote an 81-page dissertation. Is that what we call this? Yeah. Yeah. It's by Thomas Andrew Castle. Shout out to Thomas Castle. And it is called In Seeking a Definition of MASH Attitude and Musical Style. It is uh, It's available um, just for free online. Gosh, I don't want to... I don't want to lie... But I want to say that I found out about the Alison Krauss quote from, from this document. That's awesome. And I only read maybe half of it. I mean, I'm an idiot, but, you know, 81 pages is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Are you looking it up? You have it? I'm looking it up right here, yeah. But yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really tough thing to define. I don't know, listening to us silently read this document probably isn't for the best. But it's kind of interesting. He goes into some, some kind of some music theory and stuff. He graphs some interesting musical aspects that I wouldn't really think of. For instance, Hayes, if you go to page 24, there's a dynamic graph of the song Devil in Disguise, and it's by measure, I guess, how loud each instrument is. This just oh, isn't wow. the kind of thing, like, who analyzes music? Like, what am I looking at? <laughs> yeah. But he's making some kind of point, and uh, I don't know what it is, because uh, I don't remember. But uh, if you want to get into MASH, and you're very technically minded, I have a Feeling you'll like this document. Thomas Castle definitely laid it out for us here. I also have, I, I got something totally, totally different lingo, but a very cool fun fact. Do you know where the term hip comes from? You know, I don't. I, I've always just kind of associated it with like, uh, you know, like 40s kind of jazz culture and stuff like that. But, so I assume it probably came from somewhere slightly before that, you know, but literally no idea also be before i before i spoil that surprise um i i suppose that the etymology of hip-hop includes hip as like a slang term right Which yeah makes the fun fact even more interesting hip comes from opium dens because when you would smoke opium you might lay on a couch you might lay on your hip so if something was hip 
It was as cool as opium. <laughs> oh, man. It was as cool as the thing that makes you lay on your hip and stare yeah. into the abyss for hours on end. Hey, don't <laughs> talk on opium. <laughs> <laughs> Don't until you tried it, bro. <laughs> yeah, I've been known to have, you know, a couple poppy seeds here and there. Uh, no, don't do opium, kids. Uh, do we need to say that? What is it? Is it 1920 over here? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Although that's that, that's kind of late. That's like Edwardian. I, I feel like opium is more of like a Victorian thing. Is it 1890 over here? Just step that in. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess so, because we're talking about, you know, Emmett Miller being at the top of his career and minstrelsy and stuff. So I guess this episode is kind of like 1890 over here, you know? If that's right, yeah. Isn't it, isn't it interesting, too, how the how the American tune designations, like, sound so American? Like, the Irish tunes are like, oh, yeah, you kind of feel this one in three, or, like, uh, we got a bunch of eighth notes, let's call it a reel. Or, you know, like, they have these kind of things. Yep. And the American ones are like, all right, this one's only about one dude, we'll call it a special. This one, we're going to play so fast, we might screw it up. We'll call that a breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> Just it's perfect, <laughs> and and hornpipes and reels. We don't know what those are called, so but we're just gonna keep calling tunes those things anyways because that's all we've heard. Or uh, backstep. No one knows what that one means, but we'll use it. When I was a uh, um, when I was teaching at a, a folk school one time, I asked a I don't know what she was. I assume she was like a professor of traditional dance. She had some 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 kind of degree. I don't remember what it was. And she was teaching a, a dance workshop and I asked her about the the backstep thing because I had heard, you know, one of many rumors about what a backstep is, is that um, it's a specific kind of dance that goes with the tune. So like clinch around backstep has this extra beat. And so it pairs with this dance and we call it a backstep. And she's like, no. None of that's true. All of that's just made up. And I was like, oh, so do you know what backstep means? And she's like, yeah, it doesn't mean anything. So that's my source for that. If anyone knows what backstep means and you have more of a definition than this is what my grandpa said, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Reach out at uh, lessonswithmarcel at gmail.com. <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> yeah, do you know? Have you ever heard like what a backstep is? No, but, you know, I, I've heard it in a couple titles to tunes, just like you have like Backstep Cindy, you know, like where it's at the yeah. beginning of the title. But like, that, that to me, that doesn't give me any more clues as to what that actually means, you know? I'll, you know, I'll go ahead and just admit this on the, on the show right now. Marcel is definitely your historical details, bullet points kind of guy. I'm more the broad strokes kind of guy. So like, definitely <laughs> haven't, uh, f uh, you know, haven't latched onto a solid definition with verifiable facts for what backstep means. <laughs> maybe, maybe we're both just idiots, right? Maybe everyone knows way more than us. In this situation, I'm just the idiot that like knows just slightly more slightly more <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's watching this podcast just screaming <laughs> like oh god a backstep it means you know one extra beat on the fifth measure of the b part my favorite definition of the word backstep is that it's not a type of tune it's a type of pattern yeah because I call that backstepping. I use that one casually now because I like I, I feel like there's logic in that term and it being used to describe that thing. <laughs> I guess you could do it. All right. So you could you could, you know, backstep, clinch around backstep. Backstep in the backstep, you know what I mean? That's yeah, I like that. What do you call that? Uh, like the the what you call backstepping, like those little yeah. yeah. Oh, man, this is honestly a funny thing, dude, because I, I've struggled with describing these types of things to people in the past, even my own private students, because there are like music theory words for this. You know, you're like a uh, melodic imitation with one musical cell, three note cell does derived from the major scale, you know, but like all of a sudden, like you can see how like people's eyes are glazing over as soon as you said imitation, right? My you body know? fills with rage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I. This is why I like this backstepping thing. Backstepping, I think, is a good, 
you know, but what do we call it when you're going up? You know, oh, you call it front you stepping, fr easy. Front front stepping instead of forward step, front stepping back and front. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Front stepping. I normally, uh, yeah, I, I I mean, I don't get too much into that. When I explain it to people, I'm normally like, oh, you can create the pattern however you want. So so it could be groups of threes, it could be groups of fours, it could be you know ascending or descending. It, it could even be like some kind of broken pattern where. It, you like descend three and then play a third and then descend three and play a third, right? It could be like all kinds of different patterns would kind of fall under that backstepping umbrella, which I've heard people call sequencing too, now that I think about it. Yeah, melodic sequencing. I, I feel like that's maybe more the term that fires in my brain, you know, when we're talking about this specific type of thing. Yeah. I honestly think it's one of those deals where it probably just kind of changes depending on the community that you're in and what tradition you've come from and stuff like that. So. Backstepping could be kind of cool for bluegrass just because of this. Yeah, if you're listening, call it backstepping for now on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no sequencing. That's for, like, <laughs> electronic musicians who just push a button and make arpeggios come out of their computer or something. Remember to tell everyone that Marcel and Hayes came up with it because, you know, uh, authorship is important. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But they originally stole the idea from Emmett Miller, who was a <laughs> minstrel musician in the 1920s. Now, <laughs> Another music theory talk? Mm, best not to get involved. You were talking about this sort of this sort of like interval thing that you were doing with scales. Tell me about this thing. Yeah, so this always pops up with with like students that I have, right? Like beginners and intermediates are love to ask this question, like, how do I practice my scales? What do I do with my scales? There's this like assumption. Maybe I don't know if you got this when you were coming up with guitar, but like, oh, if I'm gonna practice guitar, I've got to practice chords and scales, right? Like you know those two words, and you're like, well, those are the things I got to practice for a guitar. How do I practice them, right? I'm kind kind of of the opinion that scales are bogus. I don't think, I don't practice scales in the sense that I think most people think about practicing scales, you know? So like if you're thinking G major scale, right? Like that's, that, well, there it is. I practiced my scale, you know? I'm done with it. What do I do with it, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you have a scale at home, just toss it in the fire now. <laughs> yeah, just toss it in the fire because it's BS. No. Um, but, but I think there's there's like limited value to just doing that with your scales, right? Like, oh yeah, totally. But like, when was the last time you played that intentionally and knowingly in a tune, like that that specific set of notes, like an ascending major scale? Rarely happens that way in music, right? You might have like a two or three note fragment of it here or there. But I think it's more useful for aspiring musicians, not just guitar players and mandolin players or anything, but anyone playing music, to practice scales with those patterns that you were talking about earlier, the like sequencing type of patterns or backstepping, you know, we're going to use backstepping because that's what we determined. <laughs> But we're writing the lesson as we're teaching it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But but I think that these patterns are more useful like you were you were doing this, you know, the three note kind of descending pattern, but I usually start with an ascending pattern just You know, you're just going three notes up in the scale and using that that sequence to front step up the scale there. I'm using it. Um, <laughs> I'm doing it. Here we go. Let me let me say that real quick for the people following along at home. So it's like you're playing um, Hayes is playing it like triplets, right? Um, yeah. Three notes at a time. So if you're doing a G major scale, it's like G, A, B. And then you're starting on the next note of the scale on A. A, B, C. B, C, D. C, D, E. So on and so forth. That was your pattern, right? Exactly. And, and the second one that I teach people is just that pattern, but adding one more note to it. So a four note pattern. So G, A, B, C. And then A, B, C, D, B, C, D, E, that kind of thing. So just kind of thinking all of these like basic little iterations and cells that you could use to, to front step or back step through the scale that way. When I figured that out, because me and Hayes have different backgrounds, no one showed me this. I just like, <laughs> you know, was doodling on a piece of paper. And that's how it, it made sense to me. I would take like every three note or four note, you know, segment. Or cell. Let me use a Hayes word. Every four note cell. And I would just write him like on a line and then write the next one underneath. So I could kind of 
understand how the pattern worked until it was very intuitive for me to not have to think about it. And I would, you know, look at that and play it on the guitar. So if that helps you, that's probably what I'd do. Yeah, I think that's that's kind of a great way to get through it, either on tab paper or just writing numbers and letter names out, you know, like I think any way of kind of visualizing it is useful. You know, so you may be asking like, why do you do it this way? Why is this more useful than just practicing a cell up and down? You know, well, if you listen to Blackberry Blossom, Like the first, you know, two measures of the tune are a backstepping pattern through the major scale. You know, you're you're skipping a note now. It's going like uh, your G to B A G. You know what I mean? So you're kind of like it's a descending scale pattern or scale cell, whatever you want to think about well, it. Well, no, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. It's the same pattern, just starting from a different place. If you leave out the first note of Black Ray Blossom. If you add the first note. Oh yeah, that's true. Right, it's like, it's literally the same pattern. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I guess I always just think about it with that that note as the starty note. But yeah, that's that's funny that you think about it that way. Yeah. So yeah, there are a number of different ways to visualize it, but like thinking about these scale cells and backstepping patterns recreates things that are more like real world melodic situations. Wouldn't you agree, Marcel? Yeah, like, definitely. Yeah. And it's also something that's like really fun to be creative with. What if that's one cell? Yeah. Right, you could imagine how you could like, I gave the example earlier, but you could descend a certain amount and then use a third. Suddenly you have like a really interesting scale pattern um, and maybe it doesn't count out, right? Maybe it'll like sit kind of in interesting ways across bar lines. That, that step should definitely be explored. It, what, what you're describing right there, if it sits weird across different bar lines, then all of a sudden you're not just working on melodic material anymore, but it's forcing you to work on rhythmic material as well, you know? So you're kind of pushing the ball forward in a number of different areas by only manipulating one thing, just coming up with these little repeatable melodic patterns. All right, I'm gonna give folks one more melodic cell pattern before we get out of here today, just because this is one of my favorites. You can't practice scale, scales without arpeggios, people. I feel like you gotta get your arpeggios going in side of there so our melodic pattern if we're starting on g we're going to run up a g major seven arpeggio right so g b d f sharp and then run the scale all the way back down from that f sharp and then start on your next root note in the key and play a seventh arpeggio so then a a c e g and come back down the scale so from the beginning it sounds like this Mr. Sandman, ain't it? Uh, that's as much as I'll do because let's end on a win. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. That's great. <laughs> feeling good about that, feeling good about that, all right. <laughs> Uh, no, that's a really cool pattern. And very similar to Mr. Sandman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, in fact, it, like, is Mr. Sandman <laughs> at the beginning, you know? <laughs> uh, right? It would probably just be that. It's, the melody is slightly different. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's right. It doesn't go scalar for those couple of notes. It goes back down the arpeggio. That's right, yeah. yeah. It's but pretty dang close. close. Yeah. <laughs> hey, use Mr. Sandman to create your own exercise. <laughs> Seems like the boys might be wrapping this one up. You two mind breaking the fourth wall and telling the folks where they can find you online? Yeah, thanks, JD. Um, you can always find me at LessonsWithMarcel.com or on the Lessons with Marcel YouTube channel. That's the big stuff. I don't have to mention anything else. And you can find me at HayesGriffin.com or youtube.com forward slash Hayes Griffin. Wow, we're very unique individuals. That was just the same thing twice. <laughs> <laughs>